Hello, so this is your alternative to practical paper. Uh, so we're going to have a little look at question one first. Uh, so you can see it's a moments question. Uh, a student determines the weight of a metre rule using a balancing method. What you can hopefully see is that before I even start to read the questions, I add on as much information to the diagram as I can because it will help me to understand what's going on. So. I know this is the zero centimetre mark of my metre ruler, so this is obviously going to be 100 centimetres. It tells me this is 90, um, and it tells me um, that this is the 50 centimetre mark at this point here. So, I know that the distance from the edge of A to the far end of B, 50 to 90, must be... 40 centimetres. So that's information that I have already before I do anything else. He places the load P labelled 1.5 newtons on the metre ruler at the 90 centimetre mark. So I now add a force arrow of 1.5 newtons at that point. Keeping P at that mark, he adjusts the position of the metre ruler um, until it is as near as possible to being balanced. And then he records these values in the table. So the first thing it asks you to do is to calculate and record in table 1.1 the distance B. Uh, so obviously to find B in this diagram you're going to need to know A but you can see that that's already been given in the table so that's the 23.1 and we're trying to work out what B is. So obviously if I know that A to B is 40 centimetres then B is going to be 40 minus A, okay, which is going to be 40 minus 23.1, and that is equal to 16.9. Okay, so in B, in centimetres, I'm going to put 16.9. Okay, sorry, I'll get my calculator, just blocking the light. Uh, so then, to do A divided by B, I literally do 23.1 divided by 16.9, and I'm going to get 1.366, um, but you can see uh, that this is all to uh, one decimal place here, so really at most I can give to 2, so I'm going to go 1.37 there. For my values. So now I've filled in my table, that's this page done. So then it asks you to plot a graph of weight on the y axis and uh, A over B on the x axis. Sorry, it's very blurry. Oh, there we go. Uh, you don't need to begin your axes at the origin. So they even tell you what to label your graph with. So first things first, before you do anything else, label your graph. Um, a over B is a length divided by a length, so it doesn't have a unit because um, it's a ratio. So that tells me to put things on the right axis before I even do anything. In order to decide my scale for P, I need to look for my smallest and largest value. Sorry, that's probably quite noisy. So I'm going to go between 0.5 and 1.5. So there's no point in putting anything smaller than 0.5 or bigger than 1.5. So you can see that I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and I have to use at least half of the graph paper in both directions. I'm going to put 0.5 as my uh, bottom one because that's the smallest value I need. I can then choose this one to be 1, 0, and then this one to be 1.5, because then I know I'm definitely using over half. Okay. So I now know that every four squares is 0 0.1. Okay. There we go, so you get the idea, um, and that will carry on, but I'm just going to leave it for now. Uh, then for A over B, my smallest value 
was 0.455. I'm just going to write that over here so I don't forget. And my largest one is my 1.37. Okay, so obviously on our scale we are not going to go to that much detail but we know that our smallest one really needs to be 0.4 and our largest one needs to be 1.4. Uh, so now from there let's have a little look and see how we can fit this. So it's trial and error really. Um, so this is how I do it in the exam. So 0.4. Yeah, that'll work fine. So 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, and so on. Okay. Uh, so I can keep going here, actually. It might make my life a little bit easier. Um, so I will do that briefly. Put that definitely in the wrong place. Sorry, excuse me, that's terrible. One, two. Okay, so it's okay to make little mistakes. Just make sure you're checking yourself as you go if things don't look great. Um, so hopefully that will help. So that goes there. Right, I'll tidy that up later. Uh, so now I need to plot my points. Now that I know I've got suitable scales. Uh, so I can see that when I have... Um, a, and I'm going to read A over B first and then my weight because it's easier to check my x-axis first I find just for me you can do it either way around so 0.455 I'm, as close, I'm going to get to about 0.46 because I've got 424446 that's about as close as I can get uh, so that is corresponding to a 0.5 value so it's about there my next one is 0.724, so I'm going to call that 0.72, and that is a weight of 0.8, so that's going to go here. Then 0.9 is 1, so that's an easy one to plot. Then 1.13 is halfway between those two, sometimes it helps to get your ruler out. That is at 1.2, which was this one, that's 1.1, 1.2, that's there. So you need to get this correct within half a square, and then 1.37, so 2, 4, 6, 7 is the halfway point, was 1.5, so that's here. Okay, so you can see uh, I've plotted my points there and you can hopefully see uh, that I've got a nice straight line there. I'm going to draw my line of best fit through those points as best as I can. That's not too bad. Okay, so line of best fit doesn't mean every single point has to lie on the line, but you want an equal distribution of them above and below. And um, that's about as close as I'm going to get it. Then it asks you to determine the gradient of the graph. Show clearly on the graph how you got this. I'm going to switch to a different colour to hopefully allow it to uh, show a little bit. Lots of you didn't get all of your marks um, because you didn't use the triangle method and show it on your graph. So this is very specific to physics. So pick easy points to read. Um, I'm going to pick this one here in pink and I'm going to pick this one here um you need to pick points that are not data points so do not choose these points okay they don't like you doing that because it might be that they don't quite lie on the line very well um, and then what you're going to do is um draw a triangle hopefully that's showing up oh not really 
let me just skew it slightly so that you can hopefully see where that is that's a little bit better um, in order to measure your change in Y and your change in X okay so you have to have at least half of each axis covered by those lines um, and you need to draw it on okay so this is here and here so my change in X is 1.3 minus 0.56 okay and my change in Y so I suppose you can't actually see all of this my change in Y goes from 0.6 to here, which is 1.45. So I've got 1.45 minus 0.6. Okay. So I'm now going to find my gradient. So M is delta Y over delta X. So that's equal to 1.45 minus 0.6 over 1.3 minus 0.56 and my value is I'm going to do it on a calculator uh, 1.1 uh, and then I can see that's actually 1.114 to be honest if I'm being completely honest uh, so that goes here the gradient G is uh, numerically equal to the weight of the meter rule give uh, an appropriate number of significant figures for this experiment with a unit so W equals G I should really be looking at the video as I do this to make sure I'm putting the camera in the right place. Right, so I know that I'm told that W equals G. So whatever value I got here, that is my weight. I put that number. So if you get a different gradient, it's fine because you just put your value in there. But you need to give it to two or three significant figures. Okay. Now, that is because if you look at your data... All of your weights were two significant figures, well, and your uh, A over B, here you've got one that's three significant figures. In fact, they're all three significant figures, aren't they? Um, so you can see that two or three is acceptable. Two is really the more proper way to go, but never mind. Uh, so I am just going to say 1.1. And I know that weight is a force that's so measured in newtons. Okay, so that's part D. Then in part E, uh, the student has assumed the centre of the mass is at the 50 centimetre mark. Uh, explain how you would find a as accurately as possible the position of the centre of the mass of the metre ruler. Okay, so I would need to balance the rule on a pivot with no load okay that's the first bit the point it balances is the center of mass okay so it's the point of taking the load off and then looking for that balance point because that's where the weight acts through. And then lastly, state the main difficulty you would have. It's very difficult to get a stable balance. So stability is the key there, so to talk about stability. Okay, question two then is an electrical circuit. So you can see um, you've got a power supply, a switch, an ammeter, a voltmeter that can be connected over different lengths of the resistance wire. The first bit is to record the ammeter reading. So you can see that this point here 
is 0.5, uh, sorry, at this point. So each small increment is uh, 0.02. So each bit like that was 0.02. And you can see quite clearly it's in between these two. So a little bit more. You've got 0 0.4, 0 0.42, 44, 46. Four seven. Four seven there. And the unit of current is amps. Uh, so 0 0.47 amps there. So that bit was straightforward. Okay. The student places a sliding contact at 20 centimetres from B records the value of V. Um, and you can see that's then reproduced at different lengths. Calculate and record. Uh, in table 2.1, B over L for each value. Okay, so you're literally doing 0 0.5 divided by 20. Okay, and you get 0 0.025. Okay, and when you do it for all of them, these are the values that you should have got. Have a little look at those and check. So everyone generally did that okay. Um, it also tells you to complete the V over L column heading. Okay, that means put a unit in. You know they ask these questions every time. So V is in volts and L is in centimeters. So it's volts per centimeter. Tick the box to show the conclusion. Okay, so you're looking at these numbers and you're making a conclusion. Okay, two, um, two dp all are 0 0.02. Okay, if you ignore that last decimal place, they're all the same number. Okay, and at this point you've got into the thousandth. This is such a small amount that it doesn't really make a difference. They're basically the same number. Okay, so V over L is approximately constant. So when you want to justify that, you just want to say V over L is the same value um, for all lengths uh, to, let's see how many significant figures was it? One, two, to two significant figures. Okay. So that's my justification. They are the same when I go to that many significant figures. Uh, then in part D, you are um, asked to calculate the resistance of the 100 centimetres of the resistance wire using R is V over I. So we need to go back to our table. For 100 centimetres, V was 2.40 volts for 100 centimetres. That will help us out. Okay, and in part A, the current I was 0.47 amps. Okay, so you always have to go back. Okay, give your answer to a suitable number of significant figures. So, let's have a little look at this one. We are going to do R is V over I is 2.4 over 0.47 and when we do that we get 5.106 dot 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 uh, but you are going to give that to two significant figures because this one is only two significant figures so that's equal to 5.1 ohms to two significant figures there okay it is sensible to keep the temperature um, as close to room temperature as possible. How can we minimise the temperature rise? So, you can either have said, keep the current low, or switch off when not using. Okay. And then last bit of this one, the circuit symbol for a variable resistor. So you draw a normal resistor, which is just a rectangle and then an arrow through it to show that it is variable. Okay. 
Question three then. Gosh, this is turning into a long video. I apologise. So, 3AI asks you to measure the distance V between the centre of the lens and the screen. I was pretty generous with this one when I marked it um, because I don't know what yours was effectively printed to because I didn't print them myself. Um, so, so long as they seemed reasonable and your value here was okay, I gave you these marks. So I'll do it on mine so that you get a rough idea of what it should be. So you take your ruler, measure the distance between the centre of the lens and the screen. Mine is 5.7. 5 5 okay. uh, so I know that the real exam, it was 5.8 in centimetres or 58 millimetres. Yours might have been about that, um, but on mine it's, it's obviously shrunk down a little bit. Figure 3.1 is a fifth of the actual size, so I need to multiply this by 5 uh, in order to get the right length. So I know that in reality it was 28.5 centimetres away. Uh, okay, so... Yours will obviously be a different number, so you can look at five to get that mark. With a clearly focused image formed on the screen, the actual distance from the centre of the lens to the illuminated object is 20 centimetres. Uh, calculate the focal length F1 using this equation. Okay, so we've got V and we've now got U. So UV is 20 multiplied by 28.5 over U plus V is 20 plus 28.5 but again depending on what your number is you sub them in differently for me I get um, 11.8 centimeters you might get something slightly different uh, the value on the mark scheme is about 11.8 actually but it doesn't matter if you get something slightly different. Uh, calculate the average image of, uh, sorry, the average value FA of the focal length of the lens using F2 and using your value for F1. So we're just going to literally find an average of these two numbers. So we've got 11.8 plus 12.2 over 2 um, and I'm going to get I should probably be able to do this in my head I'm just going to get 12 aren't I 12.0 um, to a suitable number of significant figures again there needs to be 3 because these are both to 3 significant figures ok so that's my value but again you might get something slightly different ok the student states that taking more measurements improves the reliability of the value. Suggest additional values for you that you could use. Okay, so you need to look at this in context and you need to think about what values for you, which is this length here, um, would be suitable. So the one they gave was 20 centimetres that you used. Um, if there are two marks, you know you need to give at least um a plural number of additional values, uh, you need at least three new values. I'd always give a little bit more. Um, and they need to be between uh, 15 and 70 centimetres with at least five centimetres between each value. Okay, so we don't want to go past the focal length. So remember that uh, we've just said that the focal length is at 12 centimetres. Let's just put that there for, for now. Um, now we know that initially this was 20 centimetres. We're not going to want to go in past here, so we don't really want to get smaller, we want to get bigger, so we want to increase you. So I would suggest going 30, 40, 50, 60 centimetres. Go every 10, that's a nice broad range there. Um, okay, 
and then state two precautions you would take to obtain accurate readings I would use a dark green so it's easier to see the light on the screen uh, I could mark the position of the center of the lens on the holder if that would help I could uh, place the meter ruler on the bench and clamp it in position I could uh, make sure that the object and lens and screen are completely perpendicular to the bench. I would suggest that the best options from the mark scheme are using the dark ream and moving the screen slowly. Okay, It goes blurry to focused quite easily um, and in a very short distance um, to get the best image. Now, unfortunately, we didn't get to do these practicals together, but when I get to you, I will show you. Uh, but you need to, yeah, move the screen slowly so that you can make the best judgment there. Okay, last but not least. So we've got um, a student investigating double walled insulation on the rate of cooling of hot water in a copper container. Places it inside a large metal container. Here's your list of apparatus. You've got that. Um, and it tells you to explain how you do it, the variables, the table, how would you draw a conclusion. So here we go, I'm just gonna start us off with the diagram. Always start with the diagram because it helps you write your method because you've thought about what goes where. So here is my copper container that I'm placing inside of the larger metal container. I have placed the thermometer in and I've put some water in and I've said to myself how much water I'd put in and what temperature it would be because that helps me with my method. I've put a lid on the copper container because I'm trying to look at how the air gap affects cooling and that's not an air gap, that's just the top. I've also put a heat proof mat down uh, so that there's no heat loss through the um, base. Okay, so that's a helpful diagram to have first to start us off. Now, it tells you to write the method next, but I would actually write the variables next. I think that's most useful. Okay, so my variables, I'm going to have IV, DV, and CV is plural. I need multiple control variables. So the thing I'm going to change is the type of metal container used. Okay, different diameters. Okay, so I'm going to change the, the diameter, sorry about the noise, different diameter of the metal container. I'm going to measure, so I am going to choose to measure the time taken to reduce the water from a certain temperature to a certain lower temperature. And I'm going to choose that. Okay, so I'm going to say time taken for the temperature to change from, and I'm going to say, I said 70 degrees, and I'm going to go to 30 degrees Celsius. I know it's going to get down to 30 degrees because that's higher than room temperature. Okay, if I said something like 10, it would be difficult to make that happen. Okay, but that's a good broad range. My control variables, the things I need to keep the same then, well obviously if I'm checking how the air gap affects the rate of cooling, that's the only thing that should be changing. The amount of water is definitely something. Water is kept constant and that should be 200 millilitres. I've just said that to be really specific. Okay. The initial temperature in degrees Celsius should be 70 degrees Celsius, I'm just going to say. Okay. Um, I know the other things that I'm going to want to uh, keep constant is the room temperature. Should be kept constant. Uh, I'm going to want... Let's think, what else could we have? Um, to, yeah, so the lid would count as a control. OK, 
Okay, so they are my control variables there that I could have suggested. I would say that the top three <laughs> are the best ones um, and they come up quite regularly. Uh, so that room temperature as well is going to be approximately 20 degrees Celsius, isn't it? Okay, so now I'm going to write a method. So that's my step-by-step -step instructions to get my answer. So I'm going to go number one. Uh, I'm going to pour 200 millilitres of water at 70 degrees Celsius into copper container to place into outer container and measure diameter of outer container and copper find the difference to find the air gap Start the stopwatch when thermometer reads 70 and stop when reads 30. Okay, get straight to the point. Number four, what we're going to do next? Let's think about this. Uh, we are going to repeat one to three uh, twice and find an average time. Five, repeat steps one to four for uh, the other containers. with different diameters and we are going to make sure that we specify at least four others so we've got five data points to plot on a graph okay so then we need to show what our table will look like so let's think about this um, I'm just going to do it on the back of this page so that I can still look at my method as I go. So we know that we are going to measure the outer diameter of metal container. Okay, and that is going to be in centimeters. Okay, then we're going to measure the time taken for the water to drop from 70 to 30 degrees Celsius and that's going to be measured in seconds. I'm going to repeat that three times and find an average. And they are my headings there. And I'm going to have at least five values, but I've said that, so that's fine. Okay, so that's what my table would look like. There are options with this. Um, you may have got them asked for other things. You could have said the temperature change in five minutes. That would also be fine. Um, but this is just the one that I've gone for. Okay, and then the last thing is the conclusion. Okay, so how would you draw a conclusion? Okay, so we will say... The shortest average time, so the container um, that had the shortest average time is the, so let's think about this, 
if it takes less time for the temperature change to occur, it's a very bad uh, insulator. So it's the worst insulator. Okay. Um, and has the highest rate of cooling. Um, I could also have plotted a graph of uh, time taken and the diameter and I could look at my gradient and I could use that to help me write my conclusion as well but hopefully that gives you enough there to see what to do.